We are facing a very exciting moment when all these new materials discovered, developed over the last couple of decades are coming in place, truly changing the way we do things from healthcare to electronics to construction and space flight. This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. I'm Nate Potker. To develop and advance new technologies, scientists and engineers need to explore new materials and new techniques to work with them. More than a decade ago, a new family of two-dimensional materials was discovered that is proving to have exceptional properties in an ever-expanding range of possible applications. We are joined by Yuri Gogatsi, Distinguished University and Charles T. and Ruth M. Bach Professor at the Drexel University College of Engineering, as well as director of the A.J. Drexel Nanomaterials Institute. In 2011, his group discovered this new family of two-dimensional carbides and nitrides called maxines. Professor Gogatsi, thank you for joining me today. My pleasure. I want to start with a little bit of background, and I think we need to set up what max phases are. Well, max phases are layered ceramic materials, where M stands for metal, A is uh, metallic or non-metallic element, X is carbon and nitrogen. Consider uh, something like a, a Napoleon cake or lasagna, and you will get a pretty good idea of uh, max phases. Of course, it will be a very uh, hard uh, Napoleon cake, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, it's a ceramic one, uh, not surprising. Right, might, might uh, cause some problems with your teeth. Like, what was the trajectory? What was the path to making the discovery of Maxine's happen? Uh, we were not specifically looking for discovering two-dimensional carbides or nitrides, uh, which are known as Maxine's nowadays. There are many researchers around the world trying to make better batteries. We were not an exception. And the idea I had was that taking these max phases, which are layered, as we discussed, just like uh, graphite, but can contain silicon as a element, we would be able to get more lithium in and carbide layers that separate silicon, aluminum, other elements are metallically conducting, so better than graphite. Got the money, started the search, but lithium did not know about our calculations, refused to go in. So we tried to do what uh, my group uh, had been doing for 20 years uh, by that time, selectively etch one of the elements, leaving space for lithium to go in. And after multiple attempts, Michael Nagib, PhD student who worked on this project, instead of just partially etching, making uh, room for lithium, completely etched away aluminum, which was an A element in ceramic, he dried many ones here, and the entire layer structure fell apart into two-dimensional sheets, which were Maxine sheets. A discovery which was not predicted before, no one expected carbides and nitrides to exist as free two-dimensional layers, and the rest is the history. Now, since then, it's become quite popular in study, and there's a lot of different kinds. Can you talk a little bit about how it's developed over the years since? Well, initially, there was pretty little interest. And only really in 2016, when in the first application, electromagnetic interference shielding, where Maxine's outperform all known materials, people started to look at what is this? Is it something really valuable? And then research started to accelerate because people found that these materials have enormous potentials in many different fields because of their unique combination of properties. And now it keeps accelerating and there are tens of thousands of scientists already who published on Maxine's. So we are quite excited with the development nowadays. So how many Maxine's do we know to exist now? At least eight, I would say, Maxine's. I know there are many more because even in our lab, we synthesize more and have not described and published yet. But if you take just a dozen of transition metals, conventional max phases, carbon, nitrogen, so multiply a dozen by 224. 
multiply by four basic structures, not taking out of plane in plane ordered structures. You get 96. Take a dozen of surface terminations, halogens, chalcogens, oxygen, hydroxyl, phosphorus, antimony, another 12. You end up with at least of thousands of combinations possible, but we can make solid solutions on M site metals or X site, carbon nitride or oxycarbide or oxynitrides. And people show that it's possible to create high entropy maxines with up to nine different transition metals in the structure. So basically, it's an infinity of new two dimensional materials in this system that can be created. So we just uncovered the very, very surface of uh, this very rich uh, materials field. I want to move into a couple of the practical applications. And the first one that caught my attention was Karagami antenna. Can you talk a little bit about how it can work in that capacity? Electromagnetic waves, like radio waves, uh, microwaves, can be very effectively reflected from titanium carbide, titanium carbonitride, maxine surfaces. By the same principle, you can use them as metal antenna. But keep in mind, maxines are metals that you can disperse in water. No additive, no surfactant is needed. Print them to any surface. We can also stretch them. We can change the shape. And particularly our Canadian collaborators from the University of British Columbia propose to make them into the Kirigami shape. This is basically antenna, the frequency of which can be changed. People look for more and more frequencies in communication. We all talk about 5G now, but already uh, the industry is preparing uh, for 6G era. And material like maxines, which are metallic, but lighter, thinner, compared to conventional metal films that one can produce, can be produced into any surface, into any shape, may help to shape the future of communication industry. Are there any currently um, in action ways it's being used? Is, is there anything out in the world today that uses Maxines? Yes, of course. The first company that licensed uh, multiple patents from Drexel was a major Japanese company, Murata Japan, which is a Fortune 1000 company, major manufacturer of electronics for automotive industry and uh, personal electronics. The second one was a Korean company, the largest manufacturer of Maxine with a couple of dozens of companies is China. My former PhD students uh, started recently a company, Maxine Inc., uh, to manufacture Maxine in the U.S. to have a domestic supply of material. And I'm very optimistic about it, uh, but there should be a two-way uh, road. It's not only researchers and small businesses offering material. There should be interest from U.S. industry as well. We've, we've talked a lot about the different uses of it. Is it a strong material? Is it very resilient? It is. Carbides and nitrides are known for their high hardness and high strength. For example, tungsten carbide is used to mm. machine metals. So it's one of the classical applications. So naturally, when you make maxine very thin, if it's like a layer, a few layers, it's still very strong. It has like a modulus of elasticity, spring constant, which is very, very high, second only to perfect graphene and actually higher than reducing graphene oxide, which is used in practical applications. And this is one area where I personally believe maxines and similar material will take us into a new age of materials, age of assembled materials, multifunctional programmable materials. So maxine flakes, when you just assemble them from solution into a film, dry it, can have strands of aluminum foil. Chinese scientists, in collaboration with uh, Professor Ray Bachman uh, from uh, University of Texas, Dallas, recently showed that if they co-assemble maxine and graphene and link them with organic molecules, they can, at room temperature, have a material with a strands which is twice the strands of steel. Now we have materials which are both strong and capable of storing energy, doing electrochemical actuation, or performing many other functions, acting as antennas if you want, or provide shielding and protection. Uh, 
So this is what we call multifunctional materials. So we still live in the metals and silicon age, considered to be iron age in terms of machinery. Uh, even Elon Musk uh, sends uh, to space large stainless steel uh, cylinders. I cannot imagine spaceships uh, that uh, will explore other planets or maybe other galactics being built of heavy pieces of metals. They need this type of a new smart materials. So we do have building blocks now. We know in principle how to put them together. And with artificial intelligence, machine learning catching up, this is where we can exactly benefit from this infinite number of two-dimensional bricks or Lego stones that we can assemble them in super strong materials with functionalities we need, able to store energy, providing protection against radiation, uh, changing their shape, color on demand. So it really does have the potential to change things in a fundamental way. The history of uh, humankind is determined by materials available, from the Stone Age to the Bronze, Iron, and currently the Silicon Age of Electronics. So having materials with fundamentally different combination of properties, which are hard to achieve or just impossible to combine in any single known materials, will open totally new opportunities. And antennas uh, or shields tend to 100 times lighter and thinner, or thermal insulation, which uh, being uh, 100 or 1,000 times thinner than the human hair and capable to provide as good insulation as a inch thick uh, uh, ceramic felt uh, with uh, aluminum foil on the top. I think they are only the first steps because they do things better than current materials. What we want to do, create materials that can do things that current materials simply cannot do at all, fundamentally impossible. For example, like materials that combine electronic and ionic conductivity and mechanical strength in one, and making this type of a shape morphing uh, flying object and stuff like that. So I'm a strong believer into the future of assembled materials. And here we need graphene, we need dichalcogenides, we need dielectric materials like boronitride and oxides. And of course, we need maxines, which have superior um, electronic conductivity, optoelectronic properties, come in a variety of beautiful colors as well. So. Can you tell me a little bit about how NSF support has impacted your career to date? NSF funding allowed me to really make some of the uh, critical steps in my faculty career, uh, starting from uh, building uh, initial work uh, in the field of uh, pressure-induced phase transformation ceramics, to developing carbide-derived carbon materials when we first extracted metals from carbides to produce porous carbons, graphene nanotubes, which led to extracting A element from max phases eventually and making maxines. I think NSF has a key role in finding really novel research. Finding uh, research that is fundamental and creates foundations uh, for all the applied uh, work um, I also was uh, talking about uh, today. So th the last question I want to ask you today is thinking about the future. What aspect of the development of Maxine's going forward excites you the most? That's a very difficult question. Initially, I was very much excited about application of Maxine's in electrochemical energy storage. I still am. We still work on the topic. Um, I was just yesterday on a panel organized by uh, Wiley and Therma Fisher on the future of batteries. And I see bright future of Maxine, particularly making like a sinecure and collector, shrinking the battery, mm. making flexible batteries or structural batteries I talked about today making printable batteries and supercapacitors that will uh, power um, Internet of Things, wearable sensors, other electronic devices. But when we found that we can provide better shielding and protection for electronics, um, 
I was very much excited by this and there are real applications and tech transfer in the field. Now, when we know about this enormous potential of Maxin for thermal insulation, hmm. heat management, I'm quite excited about it and really want to do more in the field. I don't know what will be next. We keep discovering new Maxins, we explore their properties and then based on properties, based on improved processing, scalability, we looked, uh, look into new applications. So I hope that the most exciting applications are actually ahead still. We have not even discovered it yet, but even if you look at what Maxins can do today, uh, there is clearly enormous opportunity to benefit uh, in many industries uh, from extreme uh, and unique properties of this family of materials. Interesting. Um, is there anything else I didn't ask you about that you would like to mention while we're still recording here? Well, we are facing a very exciting moment when all these new materials discovered, developed over the last couple of decades are coming in place, truly changing the way we do things from healthcare to electronics to construction and space flight. And what is important is to benefit from these materials, bring them to real technology. And who does it first, who succeeds in benefiting from these materials that can truly change the face of technology on this planet will be the leading power in the next technological revolution. And people who miss it will have to uh, follow and stay behind as we have seen in uh, previous industrial revolutions uh, happening uh, in the world. And I think that's uh, where NSF can truly lead uh, supporting those ideas. Special thanks to Yuri Gogatsi. For the Discovery Files, I'm Nate Potker. Please subscribe wherever you get podcasts. And if you like our program, share with a friend and consider leaving a review. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at NSF.gov.